So last week we were in chapter 1 of Isaiah, and after our introductory uh, time in chapter 7, we were able to understand a little bit of the historical background in which Isaiah takes place. Isaiah is a wonderful book, book, and it has many one-liners, many verses, many favorite verses. But unfortunately, we don't have a big picture, a historical context as to what was it that Isaiah was addressing. Today in chapter 2, so come, come with me to chapter 2. Today in chapter 2, we're going to uh, continue to address what we started in chapter 1 and then in chapter 7. As you know, we're working our way backwards because in chapter 7, we have a clear picture of the historical context, an invasion from uh, a coalition of Israel to the north and Aram, Aram being modern-day Syria. But there's a larger power looming, which is Assyria. So Assyria will be Babylon, it will be uh, Iraq. And so we, as we come back to the first chapters of Isaiah, we begin to see the condition of the people of Israel. In chapter 1, we have a covenant lawsuit. God takes Israel to court. And he himself is judge, as we know, but he is also the witness. He is the one that brings accusations. But in this case, uh, as opposed to our justice system, in our justice system, we are trying to find out who did it and what, sh- what should we do to him or her. In biblical justice, we're trying, to, we're trying to find out who was the person that suffered the loss or oppression and what needs to be done to bring restoration to that person. So that as God brings Israel to court, the purpose is not to determine uh, punishment primarily. But primarily the purpose is to restore Israel, to call Israel back to repentance. And we, we concluded it with that way last week because chapter 1 ends with uh, a combination of hope, promises of restoration, and then calls to repentance with a warning that if you do not, then judgment will come. In chapter 2, we break out in a classic text of hope. Isaiah is, is bringing things from the future to affect the behavior in the present. He is bringing the covenant blessings of God, painting a picture of the prophetic future of what will happen after the day of the Lord, the restoration, the flourishing of the kingdom led by Israel, as a way to confront Israel with their future, to, in a way to, to, to tell Israel, look at yourself in the mirror, look at yourself in the future, look how glorious God is going to make you, wouldn't you repent now and return to him? And then God will continue now opening uh, this avenue of returning to him, painting a picture of the consequences that will come if Israel does not. So I'm titling, and I I didn't tell the guys over there, I do have a title, I'm sorry I didn't tell you, so my bad. (laughs) They put up with me. I have a title, because in the second section of Isaiah 2, we enter into a theme that's actually very appropriate. I I didn't go out of my way, as you can tell, I'm, I'm trying to preach through Isaiah, but it so happened that in, chapter, in the second section of chapter 2, 
we have the Lord coming against this, this theme of pride. You may have heard that we are in the month of pride. And you know, I hesitated using that name in that title. But on second thought, I thought, actually, it's very appropriately named. This is a time in which people harden their hearts and refuse to humble themselves, but promise and avow to continue in their ways, and nothing will deter them. So yes, unfortunately, it is a month of pride. It should be a month of self-humbling, so that it wouldn't become a month of divine humiliation. Those are our choices. You either humble yourself or God will make sure that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Not only believers, all creation, believers and unbelievers, they will have to bow their knee. Not in receiving salvation, but they will be forced to acknowledge that he is Lord. The Bible says that demons know that God exists, but they do not repent. But they have to acknowledge. Demons in the, in the day of Yeshua, they acknowledged. They knew who he was. And they said, have you come ahead of time to judge us? For they knew he is the judge. So my title today is A Future Without Pride. God is going to paint for us in this chapter, chapter 2 of Isaiah, a future without pride. Let's get into it. Verse 1. The word which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. The word that Isaiah saw. Have you ever seen a word? <laughs> Just right off the bat, I want to like, okay, stop, put the brakes on. I want to spend 30 minutes, right? Just right here. I want to meditate on this. I want to close my eyes and allow the Lord. Lord, what does it mean to see a word? You know, many times we, we, when we say, well, the Lord spoke to me. And then, you know, when you say that out loud, people tell you, are you crazy? You know, did you hear a voice? Let me tell you, the Lord paints pictures. And when you try to describe it, that's the words. And that becomes, this is what the Lord spoke to me. He showed me a picture. Let me tell you what I saw. That's the word of the Lord. So Isaiah is going to see this amazing vision and and as he's trying to describe it and write it down, here comes the word of the Lord. Verse 2, it will come to pass. It will come to pass. There's no doubt here. It will. This is prophet, that prophetic genre. It will come to pass in the last days. In the last days. You know, this word for last it means after. And I want to ask, after what? After what? Well, what we're going to see here is what Israel will be like after 
the nations have come against Israel. Think the book of Revelation, chapter 19. After the nations have come and try to invade Israel and destroy Israel, and, and Yeshua comes in judgment and disposes of them, and the nations are left only with believers. That's the after that we're talking about. That is the last days that we're talking about here. So it will come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Adonai's house, the mountain of Adonai's house, kind of hard to follow. So the mountain of Adonai's house. So the house, Adonai's house, the temple is on a mountain. We're talking about this mountain, the Temple Mount, the, mo the most fought piece of real estate in history, in the world. This mountain, says Isaiah, will stand firm as head of the mountains. This mountain will stand firm as head. The word here is Rosh, right? We get Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the beginning of the year. This mountain, the Temple Mount, is going to become the chief, the head of the mountains. What does that mean? Does that mean that the Temple Mount is going to be the head and the Himalayas are going to it's, is that what we're talking about? Or, or mountains have a referential meaning. Are they referring to something? In, a, in, in Daniel, it says that there was the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the saints, which is not the kingdom of the church, by the way, because this is Daniel. This is the kingdom of Israel. It always has been. It says that it will be like a rock cut from a mountain, and it will grow and become a huge mountain that will fill the whole earth. And in the book of Revelation, we see uh, descriptions of kingdoms and cities as mountains. Uh, a city with seven mountains. We're, we're talking about here about kingdoms. We're talking about nations. The mountain, the temple mount, will be the seat of government in the end times or after all of the judgment of the end times, after the day of the Lord. When Yeshua comes, and he establishes his kingdom, he's going to live here on earth. He will not be in Nazareth. He will not be in Galilee. He will be on the Temple Mount. He will be in the Holy of Holies, in the temple. That will be his address if you want to write to him. Yeshua, Temple Mount, Israel. There. There. The mailman will know what to do with that. <laughs> the Temple Mount will be the chief, will be the seat of government for all of the nations of the earth. Just think about that. Just think about that. It does not look like that right now. It doesn't even look possible. But it will happen. It will come to pass that after God has judged those who are making it look impossible right now, the Temple Mount will be the chief, will be the seat of government where the king will, be, will establish his throne. Things will happen then when that, when that happens. So Isaiah keeps saying, 
It will be exalted above the hills. So all nations will flow to it. All nations will flow. The, the word here for flow is the same word for a river. The nations will flow, will flow up to Jerusalem. They will flow like a river. A river never stops. It keeps flowing, and it keeps flowing, and it keeps flowing. And sometimes when it rains, it gets really big, and it floods, and it's a mess. People will come to Jerusalem to worship the king, and they will be like, I don't know, like an ant hill that you just touch, and all of a sudden it explodes, and there are ants all over the place. That will be Jerusalem. The nations will flow to it like a river. Verse 3, then many peoples will go and they will say, they're going up and they're saying, come, let us go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the mountain of the Lord. You sang this, you, you've heard this. To the house of the God of Jacob. Come, let us go up. These are the, the peoples are saying this. The leaders of the peoples are saying this. Who are they saying it to? They're saying it to other peoples. So the United States is going to tell Canada, let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go and worship the Lord. Right now, it will be like, really? Biden will tell Trudeau, let's go and worship the God of the Bible, the God of the Jews? I don't think so. But after these things, in the last days, after God has judged all those who are against him, then these nations will have leaders that will say these things. Come, let us go up to the house of the God of Jacob. Then he will teach us his ways. The word teach here, yara, is the root word for Torah. He's going to teach us the Torah. He's going to teach us his ways, how he acts. It's not that he's going to teach us the Torah. He's not going to open Exodus and teach us, well, this is what happened and this is, you know. He's going to teach us his ways. Pretty much what he did, what we have in the Gospels. Elevated to, to a, a um, limitless level because there will be no one opposing him. He will not have to conceal who he is or what he is teaching. It will be out in the open. He's going to be teaching his ways. How he thinks, how he acts, how he loves how merciful he is, how holy he is, in which ways you will not be able to escape him teaching Leviticus. Sorry, I'm trying to help you prepare. So much of his ways, so much of understanding how holiness works, it's in that little book. And then the words that we sing every week. For Torah will go forth from Zion. And the word of Adonai from Yerushalayim. Torah. Notice it doesn't say the Torah will, come, will go forth. It's not the Torah. It's Torah. No, I don't mean the pronunciation. I mean the article. You see, it doesn't have the article. It doesn't say the Torah will go forth. It's Torah will go forth. What, what is the difference? The difference is that it will be teaching. That's what Torah means, right? Teaching. Teaching will go forth from Zion. Teaching. Instructions in righteousness, in holiness. Teaching will go forth from him. From the Temple Mount. He is teaching. And, and look at what it says in verse 4. 
he will judge. The word for judge here is one of those components of the Torah. We've talked about this. Maybe I haven't talked about this in a long time. The chukim and the mishpatim. This is the mishpatim, the judgments. This is the, ju he will judge. So, he will judge between nations. What does that mean? It means one nation has come up to Yeshua and filed a formal complaint, a lawsuit, complaining against another nation saying this nation is rising up against our nation to do war, to invade our borders. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to say Yeah, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> this nation is invading our country and firing all kinds of weapons, you know, would say Ukraine for instance. And so Yeshua will apply the Torah because the Torah includes the mishpatim, the judgments, the, the compassionate decisions. This is what justice, biblical justice is. The compassionate decisions to bring about restoration to the one who's being oppressed. So we say, so we see here, he will judge between nations. He will decide for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning knives. They're going to turn their weapons of war and they're going to turn into farmers. Guess why? because they're going to have to pay restitution to those nations that they have wronged. And they need a strong economy to be able to afford the fees that Yeshua is going to impose on them that they're going to have to pay to bring restitution, to rebuild, to, to do nation building. Right? We heard that phrase, United States, we used to engage in nation building. So we have to rebuild all of Iraq after we store the whole thing down? Well, Yeshua is going to make the aggressor foot the bill. So you're going to need a strong economy. You're going to have to turn to farming. That's going to be his decision, his judgment, his righteous judgment. Nation will not lift up a sword against nation, nor will they learn war anymore. When they see this judgment, they're going to say, ah, we're not doing that. We don't want to suffer the same fate as this nation that was aggressing this other nation. We don't want to go through that because Yeshua is going to force us to pay restitution. People will not go to war college to learn strategies and learn war. They will not need to defend themselves. So Japan will not be forced to have to invest in, in weapons of warfare because they will not be afraid that China is going to do anything to them. It's a great future impossible for us now. And the only way to get there is after these things, in the last days, after Yeshua comes and brings judgment on the current leaders of those nations who are making it look impossible for peace, for this kind of peace to flourish. He will bring true justice to the nations, not the fake justice of the United Nations. You know, this is, they have this as their motto, that nations will, will turn their, their swords into plowshares and they will not make war anymore. And I want to ask, and what about what you are doing to Israel? 
you oppress Israel day and night. And only God is stopping them from coming to invade Israel until the day when God will not stop them anymore. And they will come, led by a guy named the Antichrist. And the nations will come to invade Israel and take over the Temple Mount, God's own throne. Because that's the throne that Satan wants. And the Lord will allow them to do that, to initiate that, to begin to manifest it so that he can bring judgment on them. Police may know that you love to speed, but they have to catch you going 75 on 55. They can't stop you before. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking about you. I was really talking about me. So. <laughs> so God would allow all of this to manifest so that he can stump it out and cut it off. Verse 5. In light of this, because God has painted this picture of Israel, of future Israel. The nations will come to you. You will be the seat of government for the entire world. In light of this, wouldn't you want to come and walk with the Lord? So he says, Isaiah says, come, house of Jacob. Let us walk in the light of Adonai. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob. So Isaiah goes from exhorting Israel to praying to God. And in his prayer, he's going to reveal the reason why he is asking Israel to come and walk with the Lord. Four, in verse six, for you, God, have forsaken your people. And you say, well, I thought God promised I will never forsake you nor will I leave you. What does that mean then? Well, have you ever tried to talk sense into your children and then you have to, or I'll, I'll let you do whatever it is that you want to do and you're going to learn the hard way. Doesn't matter if they are one, <laughs> just learning to walk, or 21, and maybe in your case, 41. <laughs> God abandons Israel, that means I'm going to let you walk, not with me, not, at, you know, in verse 6, in verse uh, 5, in the light of Adonai, but I'm going to let you walk in your darkness. I'm going to, you know, you, you are the prodigal son, you are asking me for your portion, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to watch you go and spend it and throw your life away so that when you're at your end, you can come to me and I will heal you. Because I know you need healing, but you don't know that you need healing. So I need for you to go through this so that you come to the place where now you agree with me that you need healing. Now you come. That's what I wanted. I'm sorry I had, it had to be this way. It wasn't my decision. It was yours. But here we are now. Can we work on that healing? That's, that's where God is headed. But we're not there yet. We're going to go through some really tough verses here uh, in which God is uh, trying to reason with Israel as we saw in chapter 1. Come, let us reason together. So, you, God, you have forsaken your people, verse 6, the house of Jacob, for they are filled with soothsayers from the east. They are filled with soothsayers from the east. Unfortunately, 
uh, there are two phrases here, and this word soothsayers is kind of, uh, it's implied, but it's not, it's not overt. It's, it doesn't actually say that in the text. What the text actually says is, for you are filled from the east. You are filled with stuff from the east. So you see there is a need to, to kind of put your fill with something that comes from the east. What does that mean? Well, you see, the temple looks to the east. That's the entrance. The entrance to enter into the temple, you come from the east. Eden, uh, Eden the garden, was to the east of Eden. So, going away from God is going east. And whatever comes from the east implies something that is coming not from the presence of God. So, in essence, Isaiah is saying to Israel, you are filled with things that are not coming from the presence of God. You are filled with things that are not of God. And then it says, and they, they have clapped hands with the children of foreigners. They've clapped hands. Again, this simply means shake hands. They've sh they're shaking hands with foreigners, the sons of foreigners. Hey, the, the word foreigner here is actually enemies. It's a word for enemy. It's not for the resident alien. That's a different word. But this is the word for the, for the enemy, for those who are your enemies. You are striking deals. You're shaking hands militarily. You're making alliances, uh, economic exchanges. You're forming alliance, alliances with those who hate you. You know, that doesn't bring anything to mind, of course. I mean, not that we're doing anything like that, you know. And we're going to see that in this book. We're going to see how King Hezekiah is going to ask Babylon to defend him from Assyria. It's like, really? And he's going to show him the temple treasures. And they're going to strike a deal. I will protect you, buddy. And I'm going to get my hand on all that gold. Because guess what? Ba Babylon is going to conquer Assyria and Israel in Jerusalem and have the whole pie. But that's for later. They are, they're striking deals with foreigners. Verse 7. Their land also is full of silver and gold, nor is there any limit to their treasures. Their economy is good. They have a ton of money. They are printing money, by the way. That's what they're doing. <laughs> and they're putting their trust in their silver and in their gold. They're striking deals to strengthen their economy, but ignoring God. Their land also is full of horses, nor is there any limit to the chariots. The Lord told the kings, you, Israel, you will have a king, but it cannot be a king like the nations. This king cannot accumulate horses and chariots. That's exactly what we see here. They are trusting in their military power. They're trusting in their horses and their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. That's the problem. They worship the work of their hands, what, they own, uh, what their own fingers have made. So humanity bows down as each one lowers himself. Pardon them not. When I took a course on, uh, I took a course in my 
in my first master's degree in ancient church history. But then in my second master's degree, I took a course on contemporary church history, which really is American church history, beginning from before the, the colonial peri uh, period. And something that struck me that helped me understand this nation of ours is that from the beginning, theologically speaking, as you know, our, the first generation that came on the Mayflower and such, they were Quakers, they were religious people, they, were, uh, they made a, a, a covenant among themselves to, to form a, a Christian nation. But their children, the very next generation, began to move away from two things. They began, well, from several things. They began to move away from the deity of Messiah. But the real reason is because they began to, uh, they were reading about the Enlightenment and learning that man is not such a bad creature after all. So the first thing that they let go of was actually their biblical anthropology. You've heard of anthropology, the study of man. Well, there is a doctrine of man, of course, a theology of the origin of man, the sinfulness of man, the depravity of man. That was the first thing that we let go of in the very next generation not of our, the founders of our nation, but the, uh, the, not the, 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 the ones who fought for our independence, but way before that, the real founders of this nation, the ones who first came. The very next generation, they began to move away. And in essence, this had snowballed to this day and the result that we have is that we are our own God. It is what pleases me that's important. It is my rugged independence. I can do. We in America, we have become, and we've shown the West, because this is not only an American thing, we've just perfected it, but this is the direction the West has been going for three, four hundred, five hundred years now. That we are the measure of all things, that man is the ultimate authority. And that has moved us away and taking us now to the place in which we have our own truth and I get to decide my identity, don't care about reality, is I am who I say I am. That is our, the idol of the West and specifically the idol of America. Simply me. Definitely not the God of the Bible. That's pride. That's what the month of pride is all about. And look, look at the prayer of Isaiah, how it ends. Humanity bows down as each one lowers himself. Pardon them not. Do not forgive them. Do not forgive them. How unchristian. <laughs> Do not forgive them, God. Have you ever prayed that? <laughs> you wouldn't dare. <laughs> Unless it's your little brother or your little sister. <laughs> um, this is a picture of, of, uh, of people bowing down to their idols but then in doing so, lowering themselves. They are um, degrading themselves 
in following what pride leads them to, it is self-degrading. And in, in Romans says, they degrade their own bodies. And they don't even know it. But Isaiah says, Father, don't forgive them. What is that? Should we pray that way? You know, that's the best way you can pray. Hear the word forgive, uh, pardon, it means to lift. To lift up. See, lift up the burden that comes from going your own way, from becoming your own God, from going away from God. It brings a burden. Cain said to God, my punishment is too heavy for me to bear. And amazingly, the word punishment is the same word for iniquity. See, because iniquity brings a weight that becomes your own punishment. And so to lift up someone's punishment, to forgive them, is to release them from the heavy burden that their own sin brings upon themselves in the form of physical uh, affliction, but also mental and emotional and spiritual afflictions. And I say, is saying, don't give them release. They need to live under this burden if they have any chance to repent. That's what I say it means. And in that light, then, absolutely, we need to be praying this way. Do not relent, God. Continue to put pressure on them so they come to the place where they repent. It's the best way we can pray for our country. Verse 10. Now Isaiah turns to, to Israel. He turns to the people. And he, again, he says some strange things. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust. He's telling people this. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust for fear of Adonai and the glory of his majesty. What we have here is a manifestation of God and his glory that if you are not in alignment with him, you don't want to face that. And we see this in the book of Revelation. People will say to the rock, follow me, and it will not happen. They will not die. They wish to die, and they won't. They won't be able to take their own lives because God will preserve them alive so they can, they can see his glory, his judgment, and take the full measure of what they have created. The man of haughty eyes is humbled. The lofty ones brought low, for Adonai alone will be exalted in that day. This is going to be repeated. This is verse 11, and it will be repeated in verse 17. Let's go quickly to verse 17. The pride of man will be humbled, the arrogance of men abased, for Adonai alone will be exalted in that day. There will be no pride. This chapter is painting a picture of a day, a future without pride. In the month of pride, this is the Lord's message to our nation. I have a future without pride, and the only way to bring that about is to bring humiliation on those who are prideful, where God alone will be exalted, alone, no man. Look at the list here in verse 12. For the day of Adonai Tzavahod will be against anyone proud and haughty, against anyone lifted up, he will be humbled, against all the cedars of Lebanon, comparing men to trees. Uh, that are lofty and lifted up against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the high mountains, right? Mountains are kingdoms. 
against all the exalted hills, against every high tower, against every fortified wall. That's, those are walled cities. He's going from leaders of nations to nations to the cities, the, the New York, the Tokyo, the, the Shanghai of the world. Against all the Tarshish ships and against all the luxury boats, the pride of man will be humble and the arrogance of man obeys. For Adonai alone will be exalted in that day. The idols will completely pass away. How? How are they going to pass away? The idols will completely pass away. Look at verse, um, verse 20. In that day, a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made to worship to the moles and to the bats. They go into the cleft of the rocks and the crevices of the cracks because of fear of Adonai and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth. We go back to that same picture. The Lord is coming in judgment. And these people who worship idols, who do not repent, they will get rid of their idols. They will throw their idols to the bats. They are hiding in caves. But they do not repent. Their heart is not turning back to the Lord. Verse 22, we end with this. Stop trusting in man. Stop trusting in man. Fix America. Fix your anthropology. Fix your theology of man. The self, bring it down. Bring yourself down. Humble yourself, or you will be humble. You will be humiliated. Only God will be exalted. In the month of pride, needs to become either the month of humbling yourself or it will become the month of God's humiliation of you. Stop trusting in mankind whose breath is in his nose for what is he really worth? What are you really worth? What is your opinion really worth? <laughs> It is worthless. Seek God. Let us walk in the light of Adonai. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. He will teach us his ways. He will make true, bring true justice. It's so clear for us to see it. Yes, it's so difficult. As we continue to develop into this budding persecution in our country, I want to remind you that the persecution that Israel faces and will face is infinitely greater because here we have an FBI, we have an IRS, and we have a government coming after us, declaring that we are the, the real threat to democracy, your faith. But what Israel is facing is a government like that from all over the world coming against one nation. 
The name United Nations has a purpose. It's the nations united against Israel. That's their real function. And they will become unhinged through the violation of international law in the name of justice, of course. Justice in the name of, injustice in the name of justice. Because that's how we roll. It's called gaslighting. I'm telling you that you are the one doing what I'm doing to you. So you have no way of defending yourself. And all of these nations will become unhinged from justice and chaos will reign and there will be one that will lead them. And it will be a cruel one. It will be one to whom they will bow down and they will pay homage because they will respect his religion and he will seek worship from all of them and they will give it to him. See, it will be the Muslim Messiah. And for us, it will be the Bible's anti-Messiah, anti-Christ. But it will be the Muslim's Messiah. He will claim divinity, and they will respect him because they don't dare go against that religion. They will bow down to that religion. And they will struck financial deals to improve their economy. And this man will claim deity. And they will worship him. After God brings judgment, to all of that, Jerusalem and the Temple Mount will be exalted. We have to hold on to the Lord, not to our own lives, not to our physical well-being and safety. If you lose your life, you will gain it. But if you hold on to your physical life, your soul will perish. You have to be willing to be martyred for the name of Yeshua. And it's, it's not difficult, really, to die for your faith, but it is difficult to live in such a way that they will want to kill you. That's what's difficult. To be at the moment, it will be a moment, but to live in such a way It will require everything from you. You will die many times over before you get to the point where they will kill you. You have to die all the way through. Otherwise, you will agree with them and they will not bother you. That's, that's real. That has become real for us. And we pray that it isn't. It's not a decree. It can be turned. It doesn't need to be in our generation. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be in our country. It will happen. It better happen in spite of us, not because we helped for it to happen. We will be victorious. We will return with him and his white horse 
to come and judge the world if we are faithful to him. And it will be a day without pride when he alone will be exalted. This is also a picture of you. It's a picture of your future that you know to hold on to him now. Just go ahead and die now. Because you will. You will. Either they kill you or you lose your life by giving in to them. So you might as well die. You might as well choose today of giving up my life. And it doesn't need to be super dramatic. I'll tell you a simple way for you to die. Just serve. 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 Sacrifice. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your finances. Sacrifice your body. Just give yourself to God. Take that self, that American self, as the true um, replacement theology that we have going on here. That we take me and replace him. That's the one we need to fight. All right, I'm talking too much. <laughs> Let's pray.